Very uh, uh, hard uh, PBR so you can uh, get a little liquor up with us. Yeah. 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 Say anything about Hansa Dodge, and we'll give you a big thank you for bringing the food. Yeah. So I'm Nick from Hansa Dodge Creative. I'm actually representing Site 4 CMS on the panel tonight. So, as the only closed source CMS, I thought it necessary to bring you guys uh -huh. uh, <laughs> of pizza, beer, and soda so that I might survive this event. Uh, how many of you know who we are, Hansa Dodge Creative? Um, so as most of you know, we are a uh, full service agency in Third Ward, obviously do a lot of interactive, it's about 75% of what we do. We are approximately 60 or 65 developers, architects, creatives, strategists, uh, project managers, account service people, um, other folks who do awesome internet things like SEO, PPC, email campaigns that we don't appreciate, but other clients appreciate when we you know, drive a bunch of traffic to their e-commerce site. Uh, but anyway, we are always looking to hire great and awesome people. So if you ever see a posting from us and you're interested, please come on in and uh, or refer us to a friend. And with that, I'm going to hand this off to Erica. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there are kind of a topic mouthful. Hi. Do you want a microphone? No. You can talk about it. I'll give it to you. Hi. I'm Erica Conway. My brother and I own C2. We are Milwaukee's only Adobe, no, Wisconsin's only Adobe Opera Training Center. And we're also a staffing firm for creatives. And so our staffing actually extends beyond production artists, creative directors, art directors, graphic designers. We also do development, developers, front-end designers, front-back-end designers. Some of the folks in this room are on my roster and we work for our clients. Um, so I want to just 
to quickly on our the dessert table. When you go in there, there's a large bag of dry ice. Grab it by the paper, pull it out, set it aside, let people dig around. Everything that's there is on the back table, so you can see what's in there, so you know what you're digging for. And then gently place it back in when you're done with these. But please don't reach inside the bag and touch the dry ice. That can't be my responsibility. I'm absolved. You all heard it. <laughs> so our graphic designer Kevin is with the Adobe Max, and he's traveling. So he's not here, and he wasn't here to help make me a little handout. So I apologize for anyone anyone with a design aesthetic. I just apologize. So I printed out the classes that we have coming up, but on the very top, we have a, and I'm sure no one here needs it, WordPress for or basic WordPress class next Thursday. And there's a special on it just for this group, and it's on the top of this page. So, um, okay, and then we also have gigs. So, in my effort to pimp everyone in Milwaukee, I uh, wrote, we have a Python developer, Kentico CMS expert, iBooks author, and we're always looking for UX, UI, IA, and if you know those acronyms, come to me, please, I'm desperate. Um, so all the information about applying is here. None of the details about these jobs is here. You have to go to the website and check it out. If you don't see them there, you have to actually call me and find out. And then I brought the only 26 cents brochure here. Boris Aki. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks for letting me give dessert. Thank you to our sponsors. <laughs> because we don't want to get hungry over here. So one thing I want to throw out the first, because I'm a lead organizer for it, we do have coming up June 7th, 8th, and 9th, the Work Camp Milwaukee. It's a full weekend of learning about Work Camp. Uh, a couple of these people up here are going to actually be speaking at Work Camp Milwaukee, even though right now they're representing the other CMSs. <laughs> 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 yes, it is. Ouch. So this will be, like I said, June 7th, 8th, and 9th. June 7th, we have a WordPress 101 Foundation Friday. It's going to be a 101 user track and a 101 developer track. So if you're looking to jump into learning how to use WordPress, um, you can go to that one. If you're looking to jump into how to develop, start creating themes and plugins with WordPress, we have that one as well. Um, then. Well, coming on Saturday and Sunday, we're going to have two full days of speakers, a lot of local speakers showcasing our local talent, a few people um, from around the country coming in. So a um, lot of information about uh, WordPress, and not just WordPress, a lot of web development, web design, internet marketing stuff in general, too. So even if you're not a WordPress developer, there's going to be something there for you. Um, we also have some other cool stuff going on. We're give you uh, free lunches, and we have a kick-ass after party uh, down a couple blocks away at Milwaukee Brewing Company on Saturday evening, where you uh, get to sample some beer and go on a brewery tour, too. Um, so go to WordCampMilwaukee.org and um, get your tickets there. It's $35 if you want to do the Foundation Friday. It is $25 if you want to do the weekend. And we're giving you a coupon code for 10 bucks off today. Use the code WEB414, and that will bring that price down 10 bucks. So hope to see you there. Um, and I guess to start this off here, um, we had um, there had been one of these done probably about a year and a half ago, and we had a great turnout for it uh, at the Milwaukee Web Design Meetup Group. Uh, got kind of heated. Missing one of the, uh, the uh, here shakes his head. <laughs> we were hoping to get one of the other CMSs in here to bring that back, but I think we should still have a good time without that. <laughs> um, so we decided. <laughs> so we decided to bring this back. Let everybody duke it out again with their CMS of choice. Uh, we got six different CMSs um, represented here. Seven people because. Uh, in this cage five years, we got a tag team partner for Concrete Five because they can't can't do it all by himself. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Rob here decided to wear a different CMS of his shirt and what he's representing just to confuse him. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 
So how we're going to do this is um, I'll give everybody about uh, between five and ten minutes to uh, introduce themselves and introduce their CMS. Um, we have a projector. If you guys have any type of slides or anything you want to show on the projection screen, go for it. After that, we're going to open it up to Q and A, and um, hopefully nobody gets hurt too badly. So, because of how heated it was last year, I figured I have to channel my little buffer in introducing everybody here. Yay. So, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> tonight's main event is a million of CMSs. <laughs> in this corner, wearing a black t shirt. Well, version 2 of the world is in And in this corner, representing WordPress and wearing the world flag. Sales, representing Sucker, Miller Russell. In the black t-shirt, representing Drupal. How many use black t-shirts? And dressed too nice for the panel. If you guys could just try to speak up. People call me dad. Not very many of them, and they're short. Not that short. Uh, most people. 
<laughs> got me version two beta. <laughs> so uh, I'm representing for Mod X. I uh, had recommended this from the start, and when Dusty asked me to do it, I said no. <laughs> <laughs> I recommended some other people, and who also said no. <laughs> um, so this morning we decided that we still wanted Mod X to show up here, so here I am with a presentation that I wrote almost two years ago. So uh, be aware that this is not entirely up to date. So you know, it's also Mod X, Mod X, Mod X, Content Management System. Mod X, the beat up, the beat up, our content management system. <laughs> I don't know. I think, like, I did my practice with the mouse since like, the last time we did this. So, um, basically, the doctors are sites that we built in Mod X, and they're the best. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, one, one of the biggest advantages of Mod X is the speed. As far as, far as I'm concerned, the evolution, it's like, it's like, boy, it's like, it's like a nimble, a nimble 1971 kind of idea with the 2100. 76 cc engine. Okay. Okay. There's no air conditioning. There's no air conditioning, and the heat doesn't work for it. But it's fast. But it's fast. <laughs> this is Mod X. This is Mod X Evolution. Version 1.0. They have since come, have since come out with Evolution 2.0, which, which, which is a little, is a little bit more like a new Mustang, you know? You got power windows and stuff. And it's fast. And it's fast. It's heavy. It's heavy. <laughs> but it's not, it's not true. <laughs> So, so I just want to point out here some of the uh, bigger sites that we've done. You can see, you can see on each, on each one, one. We've, we've got some statistics on how they formed. formed. Uh, you can uh, see my sequel, two, two milliseconds, zero, 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 two seconds, PHP, PHP 30 milliseconds, etc. And then we're going to zip through these because the other guys think that they've got stuff to show too. This one, is, this one is now running on its own pair at, at Rackspace. Rack 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 Everything else is on the same server. But this one is, but this one is the fastest. 21 milliseconds. 25 milliseconds. To render the, to page, render the page on the server. Nobody, nobody else up here. Up here. No matter what they tell you, nobody else, nobody else is coming close to this. <coughs> They're not going to tell you. Tell you. <laughs> Here's an example, Here's an example of, uh, of, of one of those others. And this is actually a and this is actually a pretty fast, pretty efficient set. This page, this page executes or renders on the server in just under a second with only with only queries to the database. So that's so that's six mod sites and sent to the browser in a quarter of the time of one Drupal site. <laughs> MyDex is really well organized and clean. You've got very little to deal with from a design perspective, and the design and the content are well separated. Here's an example of one of their templates calling in chunks, which are static, and did I get that right? Chunks and snippets, which are PHP or dynamic. Here's an example of a chunk. Let's see, I'm just pulling in meta tags here. Here's an example of a snippet. I've got some PHP that I've put together to build a carousel. This was back when carousels were still new. This is the output from one of those templates pulling in the, the chunks and the snippets. Again, it's, it's nice, real clean HTML. Uh, and it's easy for your client to use. Very simple interface. Gives you an information architecture view of your entire site. It's very easy to find the pages that you want to edit and the content that you need to change. I've had trouble on other CMSs with that. Here's the, the resource editor. Very similar to the other CMSs that we see. And obviously, we're going to have a bunch of Q and A after.
Uh, I'm Brad Parks. I love WordPress. Yeah, WordPress. Um, so my computer can connect to the projector, so just pretend you're looking at some really awesome slides. Uh, so there's a few reasons why WordPress is hands down the greatest content management system ever created. Uh, if you think otherwise, you're wrong. Uh, so WordPress is used by like all of the web. 17% um, of the entire internet is WordPress. Uh, the next content management system is like 1%. Three. <laughs> so like about 1%. <laughs> uh, WordPress is super easy to, to develop for. If you've never touched PHP in your life, you can learn by using WordPress. For example, Michelle is in that process right now, and she's making her first custom theme, and it looks awesome. And she never learned PHP. Uh, WordPress is super awesome. It's super easy to use. Uh, if you put clients on it, you probably don't even have to train them. Uh, and really, really cool thing is because so many people use WordPress, any question you have, like a dozen people have asked it already, and there's like a thousand answers. Um, you can just Google random things and then append WordPress and you'll find your answer. Uh, there's tons of premium theme markets, plugins, the open source community on WordPress.org, building uh, plugins and themes there is huge. Um, I would say more, but I don't have to use WordPress, and you know it is awesome. <laughs> and there's two people that work for the company that like oversees WordPress in here, so they're awesome. <laughs> That's cool. All right, thank you, Kevin, for letting me use your machine to be I am woefully unprepared, I guess. So, hi, it's me again. I'm Nick, and uh, like I said, I'm from Hanson Labs Creative, and I'm here to talk about Sitecore. I've been working in it for about uh, five years. I'm actually I'm a Sitecore MVP, which probably means nothing to you guys. Um, but Sitecore is a, obviously a .NET CMS, and it's more than just a CMS. I think the one thing you'll see that differentiates it from anything up here uh, is that it's also a marketing suite. So analytics, marketing automation, uh, stuff that you guys probably don't care about, but that marketers love. Uh, it's made in Denmark, and it is commercial and closed source. Boo, hiss. <laughs> but I'm not here to spread fun about open source, because Sitecore themselves do that enough. <laughs> I'm all about the right tool for the right job, even if it's WordPress. <laughs> and Sitecore actually uses a lot of open source technology in their software. So uh, Lucene, for example, is a big part of how you work with Sitecore. Um, and there's actually a very large open source community around Sitecore CMS. In fact, I flew myself and a couple other developers of a very popular blog module for Sitecore to Copenhagen to work out a release. And they encourage uh, a large open source community around creating modules for their platform. And they do, in fact, actually encourage you to decompile their code, to decompile their assemblies so that you can see what's going on under the hood. And we'll talk more about how you can extend Sitecore as well. But there is a reason why people choose it over uh, commercial system, over open source systems. And it's why people choose commercial systems in general. They want predictability. And they want, uh, frankly, a throat to choke. Uh, you can pay for support for open source systems, but oftentimes you're going to be paying almost as much as you would for a commercial system. But again, right tool for the right job. But it just so happens that companies like Canon, Molson Coors, Universal Studios, Mazda, Kia, Toshiba, GE Healthcare, uh, CA Technologies, Revlon, and Heineken all found Sitecore to be the right tool for their job, which I think says something. Uh, so Sitecore is a very open and extensible platform for developers. That's why there's a strong development community around it in the .NET space. It uh, uses its own dependency injection um, uh, system to allow extending the platform. And uh, like I said, there's a great open source community around it. So, and the tools that Sitecore gives you as a developer are pretty massive, and I think it has a great framework for both uh, data modeling and page development. So 
So I'm going to jump around a bit because this Prezi is 60 slides. So everything in Sitecore is an item. Administrative uh, buttons are items. Content, whether it's a page or part of a page, is an item. Items have names. Items have unique IDs. Items have data templates that define their fields. And these items are all arranged, uh, much like we just saw in ModX, into an information architecture, into a hierarchical database model that often represents the hierarchy of, of your site. Uh, in Sitecore 7, you also have the option at any node in here of also uh, creating a silo or a large, just a bucket of items, uh, much like you have uh, in Drupal. Um, so that you have a very flexible architecture for both, uh, in both hierarchical or, or siloed model. When you create your data templates in Sitecore, you have a number of built-in field types that you can use, and you can create your own. You have everything from various types of text fields to model your content, rich text, numbers, drop-downs, dates, checkboxes. Files and Images has a full uh, sort of digital asset management system built in as well. Different types of links and lists of items. So, and what you'll notice is that only one field type here actually contained in the HTML. There's a very strong separation of markup, or rather of presentation and data. So, and when you build a data model in Sitecore, you're actually discouraged to use the rich text fields because you could be using the same data to drive a mobile application. <laughs> For accessing this, these items, you have a very rich set of APIs that probably the people in the back hopefully have binoculars to read. <laughs> um, so you can traverse the tree. You can get it fields. You can create new items. You can get the items in multiple languages or versions. So Sitecore key. to actually render this content. Sitecore has a component model for the page, for each page that's actually data driven. So they have a set of UIs, uh, easy to use UIs, uh, actually kind of WYSIWYG UIs called the page editor, for a end user to actually place components on a page that's all stored in the database. So based on the renderings configured on a page and what are called placeholders on the page, Sitecore will place those components and dynamically build out the page. And this is really powerful because as a developer, you're no longer creating page templates, you're creating component templates. And um, then uh, giving, empowering your content authors to then place these components appropriately on the page in the places you say they can be used. As I said, Sitecore is also very extensible. So almost everything in the system, every operation that Sitecore does, and there's no way you're going to read this. Almost everything in Sitecore is configured in what's called a pipeline. So uh, when Sitecore is publishing, when Sitecore is rendering a page, when Sitecore is starting to initiate an HTTP request, it's going to send data through a pipeline. And this pipeline could have any number, any number of arguments and could have any number of actions. Um, so all this is built in Sitecore. All these are built in Sitecore pipeline operations for when it uh, starts up, or here for when it renders a field, or here for when it uh, renders a page. So as a developer, if I want to change something about how Sitecore renders a page, I can insert, I can remove what it does, add my own. Um, extend their classes and do something extra. Uh, so, and this goes as deep as uh, removing, bringing in content into Sitecore from an entirely different database or data source and creating virtual items in Sitecore so that I can have content that to any content author appears like it's in the Sitecore database, but actually it comes from the YouTube API or my product database or from a flat file event. Sitecore also has a very flexible deployment architecture. So here we have a minimum server architecture, although um, 
Some would say you could actually run the SQL server on the same server if you're masochistic, like my blog. <laughs> you can separate the authoring environment from delivery uh, using the same database. You can load balance your delivery servers. You can have separate databases for delivery and authoring separated by a firewall for security. And then you can really go nuts and even load balance your authoring environment if you're a large enterprise organization with a lot of people trying to access the site core, as well as load balancing the delivery, and again, for security, separating everything uh, by a firewall, separating authoring and delivery. Rather. And I'll say one more time, there's a strong developer community around site core. You have a number of commercial modules that people have created, like the e-commerce module for site core active commerce created by Hanson Dutch Creative. <laughs> you have a number of open source modules available in the Sitecore marketplace, like the WeBlog blog module, um, uh, supported by Hanson Dutch Creative. <laughs> you have a strong, uh, you have strong activity in the Sitecore developer network forums, and you also have uh, a lot of questions going on in uh, on Stack Overflow. To give you a quick view of what the content editor interface in Sitecore, you can see. My, uh, my site hierarchy here with all my blog posts. You can see you have a very uh, Office or Windows-like environment with the ribbons, um, which to some is great and to others is probably pretty bad. But to your users, who are who, your potentially Windows users who are using uh, Microsoft Office every day, it's a very familiar environment. And we're all here for the users, right? Yeah. So that's all. Thank you. Close that right up. <laughs> no, I'm uh, Something that was said about the, oh, hey, I'm, oh, let me start properly. My name is Kevin Sosalski, Kevron on Twitter, K-E-V-R-O-N, and I'm going to be talking about Drupal today. And a lot of these panels I've been a part of over the years, um, some of the same faces, some of the not same faces. And something we always get to talk about our features and what our, what our CMSs can do, sometimes not, sometimes yes. What I really want to talk about today are the three big things um, with Drupal. Really, it's, it's become, it's, it's fun too, like in the CMS world, I've been in here for six or seven years and watching it. I mean, the, the old adage that whatever you thought about CMSs in the last two years, throw it all out because it's all new, is pretty much still true. Um, every two years in the CMS world. So holding things, grudges like Drupal is ugly and things are slow and WordPress isn't, doesn't have content types. All these things are like not true anymore. So you really need to think about the CMS and the decision that you're making in developing with the CMS to really fit what you want to do, what your clients want to do. No one said, no one clapped when they said the client's always right, but mm -hmm. you know, that's, that is the truth. So um, in that, in that, in that of kind of the modern CMSs are all kind of here to do the same things. I want to talk just a little bit about what I think is different about Drupal. First thing is customization. I think this is pretty much at the top of the list whenever you talk about any of um, these types of roundups. Um, the ability, and again, it's a blessing and a curse. The user interface and the user experience, totally customizable. Great. Well, if you don't know what's good or what's bad, that's actually probably a detriment. It has a complete API for configuration and management. Um, it really is PH, it's a frame, you can think of it kind of like Rails to Ruby in a way, but much more uh, point and clicky. <laughs> um, there's a large module community as well, which really helps with customization. Um, along the yin and yang concept, you know, there's, there's 17,000, 14,000? 21,000 now, good. Um, so there's 21,000 modules listed on Drupal.org. Um, none of them are for sale for money. Um, but that is a really interesting problem. Of course, there's top modules, just like any other community. Um, and those, the, a key difference between Drupal and the customization part is where you think about how you want to build a site. If, if a customer comes to you and says, I need a calendar on my site, in most cases with a WordPress or a Joomla, 
you'll download something that is calendar, ultra, whatever. It's a calendar module. It does date entry. It creates content types. It has render. It renders calendars. It does date math. It does like all these things that are like when you think about what goes into a calendar, really hard and complicated. Date math. Oh my god. So to create those things uh, in a lot of CMSs, you download a suite or like a monolithic package that handles it for you. Well, you do get good user interface. You get good compatibility within that module. But what you lack a lot of times, and again, this has gone away more and more is the ability to do things at a granular level. So if I want to build a calendar in Drupal, I need the date module, I need the calendar module, I need to use, I need to let them do that anymore. Um, there's a bunch of things I need, and I know I need to know how to novelly put them together. And I need to know that, um, I need to know a lot, but I can also do a lot. Whatever I want the date to look like, I can spit that in whatever format. Whatever I want this HTML, I want this ID to be on this field. Or there's, there's a very, very, very high level of custom my customiz customization that can come from that. It can scale too. This um, mod apps, of course, for page rendering and other things. Um, a, a fairly large PHP program will never beat that. Um, but once the page is rendered, that's when things become interesting. We start talking about caching. Ed site includes using Symfony as the HTTP base layer for the whole system. Drupal 8 is really becoming Drupal on top of uh, a kind of, uh, I'm getting too deep. I want to say high level. Um, point being, there's a lot of interesting work that's going into well, scalability, extensibility, those things. Data and configure is separate. That's pretty much standard these days. Although you will find the, the, some interesting not conformity to that. And community plumbing. I put this last, but it really kind of encapsulates what I'm trying to say is, Drupal tries to be community plumbing. That sounds weird and gross and whatnot. But if you think about community plumbing and what plumbing and the genesis of plumbing is, there were standard sets, there were pipe sizes and wrench, all these things to work on and use plumbing. So therefore, if I want to install, if I want to use Twitter on my site, well, Twitter also has a plumbing connection via their API, Wikipedia. There's all these, there's all these places that have connections, these APIs. Um, and Drupal is a master at consuming and serving out to those different APIs. That's really where it comes in. And that's, again, where the data model of everything is really granular and there's an API for everything comes in really handy because I can pump whatever I want through the pipes and Drupal doesn't care. Well, I'm going to extend that metaphor all day. Community. Um, this is, you know, it's at the top of the bubble list. Um, there's there's in-person meetups here in Milwaukee, Madison, Green Bay. Um, there's national conferences and international conferences. One's national year, one's international. So there's two, two major conferences a year. Um, Drupal.org is really a treasure trove of information. If you're saying about wordpress.org.com, or I'm sure. Um, they have great forums. All the modules have, you know, when issues are discussed, there's a very sane um, way to do it. And community norms, too, that, that are important. IRC. Uh, still exists, and there's some great, um, it's a great way to get instant help. I mean, it's not a help line. Like, don't treat it as like, I have an issue, and you're the developer that made this. That's stupid. But it's a great collegial place to talk to people. Twitter has actually really, I'm surprised, has really become a fun way to, that developer modules and theme developers and everybody comes together and just BSs about fun things. Overall, it's just a large and talented community. Um, I like hanging out with the people. Oh, I'll show this later. Uh, like, I, I play trombone. And so when we opened up DrupalCon Chicago in 2011, I got to play the Drupal song in a brass <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely show that later. Um, so it's those kinds of, like, they, someone puts on Drupal Dork, uh, and I'm putting together arrangements, and I'm going to play trombone. Got it. Done. Does this, anybody have some song? Right. Yeah, is, that's true. There's a Drupal song. Yeah. Drupal's got song because. Someone's on like a WordPress graph. It's like the unofficial. Unofficial. No, no, this opened up DrupalCon Chicago 2011. Um, <laughs> I had a baby last year, so it's not quasi. Um, roles and, so no, I didn't have a baby in 2011. Roles and permissions. I was able to leave the city. Uh, roles and permissions. This sounds like a really stupid big point, right? This sounds like something that um, all CMSs should really have, are 
the idea that they're different people. Um, but I, I said this on Twitter, and it really it, it seemed very obvious, but it was kind of profound, I thought, at the time. Drupal's made to log in into. Like, that's not true of a lot of, I shouldn't say not true, but that's not the way some CMSs are built. Um, so you get things like field level permissions. So that date, that date permission, I can access where that person can create that field or update it or delete it or um, view it. I can really granularly pick which role. And granted, the permission and role page gets kind of unwieldy because you have a rubric of checkboxes. Um, but it gives you that level of permission, which can create for, for can create really interesting um, applications. So by that same token, roles are integrated everywhere. So like I was saying with community plumbing, this, this idea of roles and field level permissions, everything, they propagate across the whole module space. They propagate across the whole ecosystem of Drupal, which makes it, makes it a little bit different, I think. And I had security here as a core competency, but it's segmentation, right? I don't want to get into a PP match with like who's the most secure. But segmentation is really interesting, I think, because that, at its core, you think about Drupal being able to segment and keep, you know, fiefdoms and those sorts of things as really something that it does day in, day out. It was like that from the beginning. Um, so, yeah, maybe a weird point, but um, those are my three big things I think are different about Drupal. Thank you. the Drupal song. <laughs> <laughs> Intermission. <laughs> it's creative problem. It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the owner of Savvy Panda. We're an inbound marketing and <clears throat> Joomla design and development firm. Um, we really have heavy involvement in the Joomla community. We host a local user group. We've held a regional conference. Um, I'm an editor for the magazine, also part of the marketing team. So we're really, really involved in Joomla. And I'm going to tell you guys a little bit more about Joomla. Uh, <clears throat> Joomla originally started in 2005 and it forked from Mambo. Uh, it's it's a, based on PHP and it has support for multiple databases, 100% uh, open source. And one of the things that's kind of unique about Joomla is it's 100% community driven. And some of the other open source CMSs, we have somebody on top who actually is kind of an owner of the actual CMS. With with Joomla, there's no owner, there's nobody at the top. It is 100% community driven. <coughs> So the, the community determines what they want. The community develops it, uh, much like the other open source CMSs, but, but there's nobody at the top, so nobody owns it. Um, Joomla, as Mr. Parks alluded to earlier, is the second biggest CMS on the web. Powers about 3% of the web, over 35 million downloads. New release of Joomla comes out every nine months. Uh, <clears throat> has both commercial and free extensions. Uh, right now, there's about 6,000 plus extensions for the current CMS. If you if you look at all the old versions that are out of date as well, you probably add in another maybe 10,000 on top of that. But um, with with Joomla, Joomla has about a medium barrier of entry. If you look at some of, uh, <clears throat> for instance, WordPress has a very low barrier to entry. There's not a lot to learn. As Kevin said later, you have to know a little bit more to get into to Drupal. So Joomla kind of fits right in the middle of that. So who uses Joomla? Uh, third world countries use Joomla. Um, small businesses use Joomla. Nonprofits use Joomla. Governments, there's only th over 3,200 government sites in 204 countries. Corporations, I'm surprised that I was actually the first one to pull out this screen of all the different corporations we're using. 
tomb, but <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about features. Joomla is the first major CMS to be responsive out of the box. So right out of the box, you're going to get both a front end and back end experience that is responsive. So that's that's one of those key features. Joomla is also multilingual out of the box, support for multiple languages. <coughs> like Kevin was talking about earlier, uh, now in the newer versions of Joomla, we have granular access control. Uh, <coughs> Also out of the box. Installs fast. Um, you get 30 second installs. And we have a new uh, user friendly UI uh, that was, I know, one of the previous complaints. Upgradability. <clears throat> this is actually a pretty big point. If you look at a lot of CMSs, when, specifically open source, not so much in the commercial world, but with open source CMSs, when you have new major versions released, it's a pain to upgrade, right? A lot of you guys know that. It's a major, major upgrade. <clears throat> With the latest release of Joomla, they have a built-in upgrader. It makes it very simple to upgrade between versions, so you don't have to go through that huge headache. <clears throat> Something that's really cool for designers, Bootstrap is now part of the core of Joomla. So for many of you that are already familiar with Bootstrap, you're able to use that. If you're a developer and you want to create a custom extension, a lot of developers aren't designers. You don't have to write a single line of CSS code if you're a developer. Um, <clears throat> you can use that Bootstrap UI and have that centralized UI and not have to write a single line of CSS and concentrate on the code that you're familiar with. And then, of course, for front-end developers, uh, you get the advantage, all the other advantages of Bootstrap, handling all the different UI elements and everything that you use on the front end. <clears throat> We have both jQuery and Moo tools that, to choose from right in the core. Uh, built in less compilers. Helpful because you can uh, theoretically have a single style sheet for your entire site. Um, Icon font library, font icon library built in, so tons of access to icons. For developers, it's uh, completely object oriented using MVC. And they've actually separated it. So you have this object-oriented MVC framework, which is outside of the CMS. So they have a framework application layer underneath, which is separate of the CMS, and the CMS is built on top of it. So it's, it's very flexible, um, object-oriented MVC. And of course, you have some of the enterprise features. Um, you have support for multiple databases, um, Active Directory authentication, API, uh, access through APIs, whether it be XML, RPC, SOF, REST, different various ones. Some of them are add-ons. Um, you have performance, uh, server-side caching. With some add-ons, you can add things like workflows and version controls. And of course, we already talked about granular ACL and multilingual. So what can you do with Joomla? There's, there's plenty of stuff. I'm not going to sit here and <coughs> read my list off. But you know, you can, you can create a portfolio site. You can create a store, a blog. You can create a custom application. You can integrate with different APIs or different CRM systems, mobile sites, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what's Joomla not so good at? It's definitely not so good at multi-site. You know, there are some multi-site extensions out there, but that is one of the Joomla weaknesses. Um, it's not very easy in pushing from a sandbox to a live environment, which is something I think that a lot of uh, a lot of CMSs, open source CMSs specifically, have issues with. And if you're looking to upgrade from an old version, just like a lot of other CMSs, from a very old version to a newer version, quite a pain in the butt. <clears throat> Joomla has very robust community, um, lots of conferences, Joomla days, official conferences. There's there's uh, multiple international, national conferences here in the U.S. Regional ones. We held a Midwest one here actually in Wisconsin. Um, Different user groups. We also hold a monthly user group here. Usually about 30, roughly 30 developers show up each meeting. So, and again, you go, you have multiple communities and forums, huge Skype chats. Um, so the community is very robust and friendly and helpful. And finally, I want to bring this up from a few years ago. Some of, some of you may have seen this, some of you may have not. 
this was the, an actual CMS showdown they did at South by Southwest a few years ago, where they took one design and implemented it over three uh, CMSs, the three major, Drupal, Joomla, and WordPress. And they built a criteria for how they were going to grade this. And you'll see here total hours, hours spent, custom codes, validation, everything. These are the criteria. And Joomla won every single one of the criteria. However, somehow it was ruled a tie. <laughs> Don't ask me how, but it's pretty clear what the data was. So thank you. All right, well, good evening. My name is Chris Remington. I'm from Trivera here at Menominee Falls. Uh, I am e Milwaukee on Twitter. If you want to follow, we're going to talk about Concrete 5 tonight. With me is Chris Graham, who's one of our clients at Potawatomi Bingo. Just a little bit about Trivera. We were founded in 1996. We've been doing web design since then, we're doing SEO since 97, email marketing since 98, website hosting since 98, e commerce since 99. Mobile, 2000, content management systems of all types since 2007, social media since 2008, and we have more services to come as part of our march towards world domination coming later this year. We've literally done thousands of engagements for hundreds of clients over that time. I will say at the beginning that we are, for all intents and purposes, platform agnostic. In other words, we have experience on staff with a variety of uh, content management system applications, Drupal, Joomla, WordPress, Concrete 5, we've done Expression Engine, we've done uh, Digitalis. As was mentioned earlier, our focus really is to find the right platform for the client because ultimately what we want to try to do is keep the clients as self-sufficient as possible so when they get the keys to the site, they can do what they need to do, it, do to it and with it without having to come to us every five minutes. So we sit and we listen, we do discovery, we find out exactly what they want to do and then based on their needs, we make a recommendation on the CMS. Over time, however, we have found that Concrete 5 has become that CMS of choice for the reasons I'm going to go into right now. So here's why clients prefer it. I'm in the business development role, and when I talk to customers about their applications and about their needs, we range from the C-suite all the way down to um, webmasters and marketing folks. The IT folks love Concrete 5 because it's very safe and it's very scalable. Marketing folks like it because it's very, very easy to work with. There are no technical skills required at all. No HTML, nothing. Webmasters like it because it's very, very robust in terms of permissions and roles, and Chris will talk a little bit about that uh, as well. But it's very easy to set up um, different levels of permissions and uh, access, publishing rights, printing rights, editing rights, etc., throughout an enterprise. Sales folks like it because it's very SEO friendly out of the box. There are vanity URLs available, so if they're going to a trade show or advertising something in some publication, they can have it be domain.com slash whatever, and it can automatically be uh, generating a page for that. Operations folks like it because it is very easy uh, to connect to backends. We have done backend connectivity to AS400 systems, to QuickBooks, to a variety of other existing applications, a Salesforce tool, and so forth. So uh, connecting it to a backend uh, is quite easy. The users that we work with, the ones that are going to be touching this every single day, they like it for the following reasons. It has a great in-context WYSIWYG editor. If you can create a document in Word, you can do anything you want to uh, in Concrete 5. And you can actually see the page that you're going to edit in live view uh, and see your, your changes before you actually push them live. And Chris will show you some of that as well. Workflows, roles, and permissions are very, very easy to work with, um, which helps a lot of times when customers are um, doing their other jobs, they have other things that they're working on. Now they've got this website they have to take care of to be able to build in workflows and make it be very easy for them to manage the site is one of the best things about it. The asset management tool, the file manager, is very, very robust. It's very easy to manage assets, so whether they're videos, PDFs, uh, images, whatever the case might be, it's very, very easy to, to uh, manage them, to, to load them, to categorize them, to deploy them. 
The form builder is also very, very easy to build. So a client can build a very easy contact us form or something more in depth with required fields, with radio buttons, with whatever they need to do. Um, that comes very uh, robust out of the box. Very flexible in terms of metadata input, and it's also very SEO friendly. So clients can come in and change uh, keywords, can change meta descriptions very, very easily per page, and there's also ways you can do it site-wide now. Out of the box also, there are many things that it has, but I've listed some of the big ones here. Uh, the ability to, to run a custom slideshow is very, very easy. So clients that want that movement on the front page, they don't want to use Flash, they've got some images, they want to show some movement, they can load those in very easily, they can drop text over the top. It's got YouTube integration, it's got Google Maps integration, the list goes on and on. But out of the box, it comes with all that stuff. So, why do designers and developers prefer it? Well, first of all, it's very, very easy to set up the templates, the themes, and, and the CSS. It's got an active and supportive community. I will say that the community is smaller in size than the others that we've talked about. It is a newer, up-and-coming tool, so the, the community, uh, likewise, is, is smaller. Um, but we've had very good success with the community in terms of providing information to them, getting information from them. Um, they're very, very responsive in that regard. Uh, the organization, the structure, uh, it's very well organized. The system itself is also very scalable and it's also very flexible. Uh, the system will actually automatically detects the viewport with provided user agent string, which basically means that the site is going to adapt uh, based on the device and serve up the proper templates, especially for mobile. Uh, the integration and modification of add-ons is very easy to do as well, and there are lots of them in the marketplace. This is, I think, a really important one. The site is, is easy enough for us to work with, uh, which is great, but it's also easy for the client. Um, you know, as I said before, we're going to turn over the keys to this site at some point to a client, and I don't want to have to give them a 90-page manual that says, here you go, here's how you work it. Usually with an hour or so of training, Clients are all set. They're ready to go. They can do whatever they need to do. We can be available for support as needed, but seriously, with an hour or so of training, they are off to the races and can do what they need. Another thing that the designers and developers like is there are what are called stacks. I think Chris might touch on this, but really what these are are blocks of content that once you change them once on the site, it actually goes in and updates them throughout all the locations uh, throughout the site. So it's very, very easy for you to, to manage content that's going to appear in multiple spots. Here's a quick couple of quick examples of some of the sites that we've built recently. We've done about probably three and a half, maybe four dozen sites in the last three years. Hussars House of Diamonds um, recently launched. Color Direct, a printing a shop up near Miller Park. Um, George Webb. This site actually has the, uh, the out of the box e commerce module. So if you want to go and order a hat or a shirt, uh, that type of thing, the module is something that we're actually working on uh, for the more robust e commerce needs. We're actually uh, actively recommending Magento for the right kind of client, but for, for somebody who has um, you know, the shirts and hats types of things, the e-commerce module that C5 has out of the box is very, very sufficient. Uh, Care Plus Demo, we just launched this. This is a fully responsive website that we built for them. Um, and it's got a lot of deep content. There are some interactive wizards that were built for this as well. Del Campo Chorus is one of our nonprofit clients. Um, there's a link to a blog here. There's also some e-commerce activity on the back end. MM Office Interiors, some of you might know of Wayne Breitbart, this is his operation. Uh, Mitchell Airport, we've been working with Mitchell for about 16 years. Yes, the site is busy, but they have a lot of things to convey. There's also a mobile site that's being run from C5 as well. Uh, an interesting thing here is that the mobile site has a lot less content than the main site does, so as you're working with clients on these, I'm sure you know that it's important to come up with the mobile strategy. Um, you're not going to find on the mobile site history of who Billy Mitchell was, you're going to be able to find out arrival departures, parking information, and so forth. If you want to learn why they call it Mitchell Airport, you can go to the main site. Here's some other clients we're working with that are using C5, Adelman Travel, Timberman Airport, Met Milwaukee Rescue Mission, Storage Systems Midwest, Wayland Academy, and uh, Beaver Dam, Frank Mayor Associates, working right now currently on Perla Corporation, General, or Greater Milwaukee Foundation, and Dental Associates. One of our, probably the premier client here in town in terms of Concrete 5 and maybe nationally, uh, is Potawatomi Bingo, and um, you know, I, I wanted to bring Chris here because we really view all of our projects as partnerships with our clients. So uh, it's, it's very, very collaborative from the very beginning, from the discovery, uh, all the way down to the deployment and the post-launch support. And so to really show that, we wanted to have Chris come and, and give you uh, kind of a tour of the back end of, of C5 as, as he sees it. Um, we didn't want to go onto the live site here, but we've got some screenshots 
uh, of, of the casino site at paysbig.com. So I'll turn it over to Chris. Well, thanks. So who wants to build a website and maintain it day to day? That's what I really want to do. So um, I really like C5 because I log in and I can see the site structure and everything the way that I want it to. But if I need to get in and actually make changes, it's very, very easy for me and very, very easy for the 17 other departments of my company that need to get in and update things on the website. Um, and I really love C5 for being able to do that. So if I needed to make changes to the Wild Earth menu page, um, I would just find that page that I needed to, and I can actually change the properties, set the permissions, that if I actually wanted the restaurant manager to actually go in and make their own restaurant, um, their own menu updates, they could be able to do that. Um, to do the SEO for this description, and everything like that. I can just change the page properties and there's a description field right then and there. Um, to do different sorts of um, paths like Chris was talking about. I can do it to pagebig.com slash wild earth and I can just make that right from the page properties. Or add any other kind of like extra header content or change the meta title, meta -title uh, for SEO. I can do that all right from the site map. Um, permissions as well. Really easy. I can set up many different types of um, groups and give them different permissions based on um, what I want them to be able to do. There's a review so I can give it to the link out to anyone in my company to actually just review the changes but they can't um, uh, preview it or publish it. Um, the file manager of C5 is awesome. I can upload an image and I can set it to sets. I can easily find things based on what I need to. So if I upload a, an image for a promotion that's going on, I can tag it as a promotion set. And anytime I need to go back in and find something for a promotion, in the, I can just go to a set, check the little checkbox right there. Um, I can actually change all my file details that I need to for my, um, for my title here. I have a Milwaukee concert based for SEO, and then my um, Pop and Rock Royalty Tribute Show, which is coming in August. If any of you want to see a great Michael Jackson performance, you should come here and see it. Um, so I can do that all from the title. Uh, if I'm adding blocks, it's really, really easy to be able to find anything that I need to. Um, but like I said, if I'm going to the Wild Earth page and I need to change something for the menu, um, I just log in. It's really easy to see if I'm logging in, which is great because I'm actually editing everything on the page. So my person who's actually updating the menu is actually going to be able to see everything on the page. Uh, by logging in, they can see all the edits, all the things that they can edit, they're called blocks. Um, like for Drupal, you can change the different um, permissions based on the block. So if I don't want them editing the navigation, I can change that permission really easily. So by finding the block that I need to, I can click on it um, and go to edit. There's also some stuff in there for permissions at the bottom. I don't know if you can see that in the back. Um, but it's the same permissions wizard that we saw from before. Um, the great WYSIWYG editor, which is awesome because they can update everything from Word, just pull it in, copy, paste, bold, italics, everything that they're used to seeing in Word, they can do right there in the WYSIWYG editor. Um, I make that changes, and then I can actually review, uh, review the versions. So if I um, have something which is in bold here, which is um, published, and then I can see that there's updates from Lisa that needs to be reviewed, well, what did Lisa really change? I can go in there and compare different versions and I can see, oh, okay, well, Lisa added this and she changed that or she updated this. And it's really easy for me to be able to see, yes, this is good or no, that's not. And I can make changes as needed. Um, another ad block. Um, the slideshow that Chris was talking about. You know, we have a new um, hotel coming up here at the casino. So they needed an image, uh, an image gallery. So I added this block. And in the back, it's really easy if you have simple Photoshop files or um, some templates. You know, you just create a standard image size, you upload it, you can put it in your description. Um, that shows here at the bottom underneath the image. And you can add your image in, you can move things around. Um, very, very simple, easy block for image gallery. Um, themes and page types, not something that I really oversee as the client, but um, I can have pages and themes set up. As you see, we have something for our desktop version and our mobile site all which runs out under one install of C5, as well as the Honeymoon Powwow website, and it also plugs into our intranet. So we have one instance of C5 running about four different sites, which is awesome for me because I only have to put everything in one spot. Um, many different kinds of page types, you can set it up very easily. It's all wizzy way, you just edit it, put it in, uh, make the change, and I have that um, set up. So if I need someone that needs to add in a different page, 
Um, I just, just say, you know, add an extra page, figure out your page type that you need to, and boom, it's there. So for me being able to hand that off to someone who isn't very web savvy, they can do that very simply. And that's a really quick run over at Facebook.com. All right, it looks like they're trying to bribe us with Concrete 5 because they got stickers. And yes, we're, we're the only CMS represented that has a whole lot of swag. So if you need the stickers or pins or buttons or a uh, Oh, that's right. GG here, come grab it. Uh, so I'm going to take the mic and hand out to people here. Uh, do you have a Well, that's a good thing. Mod X has a discount for you, though. I mean, the sticker will get you so far. <laughs> <laughs> the Mod X Cloud, which does really, really cool hosting. It's a lot like Drupal's Acquia hosting, but it only costs one one hundred this much. <laughs> and they're giving like an extra 15% off with a web 414 coupon code. But it's for your first year. Um, question to the panel? Or, OK. Go ahead. I can give you the microphone. Take the microphone. I don't need the microphone. OK. Nick, is Sycor only for enterprise level clients? Um, I would say no. I mean, your your cost of entry is pretty high, so I'd say for mid market, large, small business would probably be starting point there. Um, I, don't, I don't think Cycle would like me for a number, but you're starting at about twenty thousand before you twist that around and not off. Um, question. A lot of our clients are um, small clients, and we try to move them through very quickly. We call it rapid web development, and we try to knock out sites within a few weeks. But one of our challenges is getting content into the system quickly. And actually, we've kind of developed our own content management system, but I don't think it's a deal. Which of the systems that you guys are promoting would allow me to have my clients either add the content ahead of time or myself add it ahead of time? And I realize you don't know where it's going, but I do believe you can have a complete separation by taking your content as what type of content is it, what sections would you want to go in. But I'm really looking for that opportunity to do that so we can start building the site content before design, layout, anything else has even been thought of. I'd like to suggest that when you're organizing your site, you really need to start with that information architecture, that you need to know at least a feel for what you're building. And once you've got that, then you can start putting the information in in places where it will flow into its final position. Agreed. We, we do start with a site map. So we know where the content is kind of going. But in terms of formatting or anything else, basically we get people to add it as a heading one, some body topics that are very simple. But I want to be able to do that with a off the shelf system. With Mod X, you can actually do that. You can set up your, your site map, your information architecture. And you can have your client start putting stuff in, even with a default theme, if you'd like to do it. However, I'd also like to suggest that you look at gathercontent.com, which is a, a site out of England. It's not particularly expensive. Um, working on like five projects at a time, I think they charge you 40 or $50 a month. But it's really well organized around setting up. The, the structure for your information that you want your customer to provide, and having them get the information into the system, and then they make it relatively easy to move it from their system into not mod apps, but WordPress or Drupal, um, and into a number of other platforms. So gathercontentcap.com is a, a, something worth looking at. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think I need it. I can't speak to the other one, but I think the majority of them let you put in your information ahead of time and organize it. And then if, you, if you're going to put in classes, just put in generic classes and we'll figure out the design later. But I also would recommend gather content when problems you have to move it from one site to another site and you're done with gather content. But it is, it is a nice way to get content that you find very quickly ahead of time. Yeah, I think any of these systems with a strong separation of content and presentation would let you do that. But it almost forces you to work in a really waterfall manner because you need to define that data model for your full site up front. What might I might encourage you to do instead is to work more iteratively or agilely and say, work on say an event section first, get your presentation and your content defined for that first. And while your client's entering event data, 
move on to, say, your product title or some other types of things. Are you talking about automated import? Like I have a spreadsheet of content? Okay. No. But we are trying to make sure our content is completely equal. So we don't want the structure, we want the structure that's you know it's a little bit limiting with it. That you know, you talk about event only. We want to be able to use the same content entry as a an entry on a page. We'll pull it all the other so it's, it's a different concept, but we're trying to do that to wrap the web development. There's a yeah, yeah. cool module for Drupal called uh, Mass Content Creator. And you can just put in just a uh, list of your, like your menu items. You'll create those, and then the next round, you take everything below that. So that's one of the first ones you created, and you'll create pages and menu structures. Yeah, maybe we can talk about that more than after. So, more questions. And did you have something you wanted to say go first? I wanted to just ask if, if my experience is to share it all. How, how many people here are building sites for people versus? Let's ask it the other way. How many people here like have a site in a community because they want to build their site, not that they build sites for other people? Are there customers here? <laughs> Everybody's going to appreciate this, right? You know, the three people who are going to get like bombarded after. Okay. So in my experience, customers they go through their one to three hours or days or weeks of training or whatever, and three months later. Only one in ten of them is still editing their site. So I'm just curious, as, as developers, uh, if you're seeing that with your customers, obviously this is not happening with a lot of you're 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 like one in ten, right? You're like three out of the ten. <laughs> uh, but I'm curious, is, is, are other people seeing customers who a year later consistently are working their sites? years later, why is this site not have this feature that I never asked you to build? Great question. You're seeing a shift in that because of the shift in what marketing is doing, the shift in how people are attracting traffic to your sites, and being with, with content marketing and email marketing taking over as a career strategy, it's forcing people to blog and update their content. So even if they're not now, in the future, you're going to see people using their sites a lot more and continually adding content a lot more. But are you managing that for them, or do they manage it? We do it both ways. But like we encourage them to manage as much as they can. Oh, and they want to encourage you to let them manage it as much as they can. Part of that also has to do with the resources of the client. So bigger clients are going to have more resources that they can dedicate the updating. Um, if you're a one or two unit shop, you already have a price shop and cost. The client only has a few people, they're only able to do so much with the time. So they have they're spread out the yeah, I, I, I'm I'll answer pretty close, actually. The, the answer I thought was does that client see their website as uh, checking a box on a marketing strategy or as part of their core business strategy and, com and comprehension later? You know, uh, I built a big e commerce website. They uh, they're the McDonald's. They close for the winter, so they're using that web. They use that website every day and are constantly updating, and making their product fresh, right? It's like the bread and the after season bread and butter. Whereas the other, mostly if it's like we need a website, marketing guy, make a website. We make a website, great. Right? Yeah, those those have, and that's half the time. I would say for us, the vast majority of the clients that we're building websites for have total control over them. They want that control. They're updating the sites on a regular basis. We're able to add support and augment their staff if need be, but the whole idea of building a site and a CMS is really to give them that control, to allow them to be self-sufficient. And nine times out of ten, they're doing that. We can come in, we can be editors, we can be authors, whatever they need. But for the most part, it's their site. They have a editorial calendar, a content strategy. They're maintaining it, and we're able to support it. But it's that's the way I think most of our clients operate. Yeah, if that's what what your experience is with concrete. Five. I would encourage you to seriously consider that. Um, I think that getting the, your client involved at that level it, is a boom. And if Concrete Five can do it, despite the fact that they're using what's the uh, the JavaScript program for the WYSIWYG editor and, and Tiny MCE, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, Tiny MCE experience. Um, but if you guys are doing that, then that's that's. I think the nature of it is that it's fine. so easy to use that that they're they're empowered to do it. It's very easy for them for them to do so. 
And, and I sit in marketing. I give my menu over to each of the restaurants. The fire pit updates their, their menu once a year. So once a year, they actually feel empowered enough, that's what we're all talking about, to actually get onto the website and make their updates as they need to. Once a year, they know that they know that it's just familiar to them. Do you have any questions here? Yeah, I'm going to go with the wants to update it, would like to be able to put new things on their website pretty regularly, don't because they can't figure out how. Um, and for a lot of smaller organizations, especially nonprofits who don't have a lot of extra money, you know, they'll put out the effort, you know, like I said, it's one of the things you have to do, you have to have a website. So they'll put out the effort to find somebody to put together the website for them, but don't have you know the money to pay for someone to fix it to update it all the time, but also don't have the knowledge to update it themselves. So, I mean, if if you're suggesting Concrete Five would be an option for making something so easy that people could update it themselves on a regular basis, that's wonderful. But that's where the issue is. I I look at being that you know I'm the products guy. That concrete finds with some really cool things going there, and I've seen it in use, but it is really cool. Drupal has a um, has a distribution that's designed for churches, and it's really easy to work with. Um, one of the most beautiful things about Drupal, and I'm not a fan of Drupal, one of the most beautiful things about Drupal is the way that they put together these different community packages or community. Um, Pre-packaged system, so that they've got like, churches, conferences, governments. It's really cool that they they really focus not just on the Drupal community, but the communities that can be empowered by Drupal. Um, and then uh, WordPress. Um, WordPress just lots and lots of people use it. It's relatively easy to get help with it. My wife does hosting that includes updates. Uh, security updates and stuff here at WordPress. Um, you get that kind of stuff cost effectively. So um, I think that you got some really good choices. I'd say that everyone's the same wrong for you. Really, if you're not, if you, if you, I'm serious. Like, really, if you, if the budget is that tight and if um, updating is, is that much of a barrier, there's things like there's even all these things you have to install yourself. A lot of us hosted and this. And, you know that, like, look at Squarespace. Look at like simple blog. Look at WordPress.com. Look at look at look at places where you pay eight bucks a month, and it's as simple as possible to add an update, and it's your hosting, and it's your security updates. It's a whole crap load of things we haven't even talked about tonight. But I think these types of things are even too much sometimes, unless you have someone at the church that can is going to take ownership and update it. That's sad. Like I, there there's still way way cheaper ways. If, if really what you want to do is just get your information out there and update people and you know we the updates or something like that. I'm actually going to disagree on that. I've talked to probably hundreds of people that have no technical experience that they bought some hosting at GoDaddy or other crappy hosts. Did they want to click install? So they said, I want WordPress to install. They go and they buy a premium theme or find a free one. They drag the file into WordPress, it works. They go through some settings, it works, and they, um, it's extremely easy to add content. Say you want an event calendar, you just go add plugin, event calendar, install, and it works. Um, it's really, really difficult to break WordPress. What do they do security updates for you? That's what I think WordPress.com is. Yeah. Something hosted is just <laughs> right away. It, just, it depends on your host. I host that. Then that's not yes, a target. So, in this situation. But they have an whole WordPress WP engine that will manage security issues for you and yeah, again. Yeah. She's doing Legika to the empowered hosting, she's specializing in hosting that builds a community of especially women bloggers. I mean exclusively women, especially bloggers. 
and supporting each other in how they um, how they're maintaining, how they're managing their sites and their businesses. Because um, it's really a significant portion of our community, a very significant portion of the women in the tech community are women who run their own blogs. And uh, I think it's really important to support that area. These are techies, these are developers, and too often we don't see them that way. Um, and we really need to we need to make that opportunity. So um, one thing you mentioned here was um, security. I think that's an important topic. If anybody here wants to comment on security of their systems, our WordPress is the most secure. <laughs> 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 and if you believe that, WordPress is actually extremely secure. The reason there's a connotation of it being insecure is because it's made by 17% of the web. Even if one, you know, one tenth of one percent, they install a crappy plugin or they install something that makes it exploitable, that, that little time for something to work. Let, let's do one thing straight. The only secure CMS is one that isn't installed and the computer is unplugged. I'd like to point out that there's a dichotomy happening here. The bigger and the stronger the community of developers behind your product, like WordPress, like Drupal, to a lesser extent, like Mod X, but Mod X just isn't as popular. Um, the more people you have developing on it, the easier time you're going to have finding crap to install. Mm -hmm. and the harder time you're going to have finding good stuff. Um, and I'm working on an entire presentation on this. So it will be at that conference in the Dallas this summer. Navigating the bizarre. How do you find software, libraries, plugins, add-ons? How do you evaluate them? How do you find them? And know that you're getting something that you can trust. And unfortunately, and it's great, WordPress has so many plugins, Drupal has so many add-ons, Doom even has quite a bit, right? If this is really cool, the way that the community has just come together and contributed and shared, open source. Unfortunately, many of them are like, we all start out. You know, I, I needed something. So I learned how to program so that I could make it. And then I shared it. And it turns out that I'm not a very good programmer when I'm first learning how to program. <laughs> so a lot of the security, um, the perception of security issues, the word comes from Drupal, any of us, is often based on the fact that we have big hearted contributors in the community who just don't know what they do. Yeah, I think the real the real idea of security is yeah, every one of these CMSs out of the box is going to be pretty secure. But it's if you do something stupid, like your server might be exploitable. There's a lot of other reasons you can get hacked or exploited that aren't the CMS. So it's really nice to like get a post that's secure, um, use security and protect yourself that way. Um, yeah, doing this. There's a uh, there's a startup in the Joomla uh, community that's coming up called Savior Labs, and one of the things that they're one of the things on their agenda is testing for security vulnerabilities of the entire publicly available extensions. So it's not just the core code; it will be testing code quality and and uh, and security vulnerabilities for all of the extensions. Drupal does in a way that they have the security team that roams around the area. Yeah. A little bit. WordPress has the same thing. We have security that goes through. It's also a lot of you know, 25,000 plugins. So a whole check out. I think they even own it. Look at Calc your data and smash it that way. And then, uh, and then, like, we each said, we have some, so you can make it look like there's 64 voting to cover the plugins if you don't allow them to do. And then we'll go through and uh, and it's just to go through the change log to see like, what plugins get changed and how they change. Because so we'll go through and vet them at first. Like when someone submits a plugin, like, hey, here's my fancy plugin. We'll go through and we'll review it. And if it's good the first time around, we still assume it's going to be good. But kind of like updates after that, it's going to have to be manually audited. Like somebody's eyes have to go through and look at that code. And uh, 20,000 plugins and, you know, 
thousands of changes every day, so a lot of code. So, so the team of uh, like our security team is probably 20 or 30 people deep now. They go through and just do it and volunteer their time. They're just people that do it because they like, enjoy doing it. And so the plugins are like a, a module, but they're also sort of like an easy factor because sometimes it takes a week for someone to find something. Like things um, I was talking about here, she goes through the web. But eventually you find them and we have the power to like shut the plugins down, we can stop it being updated, we can sort of do something around that to like do WordPress and that where we make sure that like an update will come through that we can sort of fast track that update and we can do some stuff that we can do. But you still have to click the update button yourself, right? Not quick to say for C5 the upgrades the upgrade path is really consisted more of uh, rolling out new functionality versus any any sort of vulnerabilities from that kind of but that's not to say it's not a benefit of sure it could be at some point, but it's been more functionality based in terms of upgrading as we had no security at all. Gmod has a very similar process, embedding your extensions and pretty much if the security vulnerabilities don't only turn it off until it gets fixed. We also have a vulnerable extension list that gets that's published. Uh, they do automatic code scan, I believe, as everything is submitted, they're, they're added automatic. I know they look at the data systems as well. I know uh, the, the core base of the uh, CMS itself is an investigation trying to get out of the but it's a very similar process where you have this big security team that's the same for the password. One of the reasons that Sitecore is popular in the enterprise is because if you do have the ability to separate the content offering and the content delivery environments even at the database level. So again, not that it's impenetrable, but when you publish something in Sitecore behind the firewall, that firewall needs to be able to see the, uh, the content database. But as far as any users that are reading that content to serve it out to the web, uh, it can be read only. So to that point, any vulnerabilities on the delivery side um, are limited in their ability to affect your content, certainly their ability to affect the master copy of the content. This also makes Sitecore a very difficult platform for doing user-generated content. But, um, uh, that was OK, one question. We have one here. All right. Um, kind of a more design-based question. Um, and my experience uh, is solely general uh, for the most part. But um, in the sense of looking, you know, I you know, prefer completely custom things. The templates don't like really much. Um, so out of all the CMSs at this table, which one is uh, easiest to hook to the template and get a really customized site? Which is the easiest? <laughs> Which is the easiest to implement? Well, it's a sense of uh, you got a completely custom plan to implement. Yeah. yeah. No, so just because you had a site that's standalone, you don't have to figure out actually what the plan is. I'm going to reply based on data. If you look at the CMS Expo, or CMS Shona, I just prepared. That was from four years ago. My self by self was sure because I'm here. <laughs> Than that showdown. <laughs> sure, I'm wearing it. Yeah. It was four years ago. This is the improvement. The bootstrap library that kind of gets you going faster. And, and, and so that that helps you go faster. But based on that, the, the front end is going to be a spectrum 50% less, and the back end of all the spectrum 20 to 30% less. So the overall time was less, and the errors uh, that were the errors. There's a custom code that was required with some less and others and others. So. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that of all of the CMS that's in here, it's possible except for the concrete five. Mod X gets you closest to writing a page in HTML. And then filling in the domain. Um, so in terms of having the most possibilities to do something custom, I, I think you can do it there probably. Is. There's um, there there are very few like, systemic restrictions on how you structure your templates. There are better ways to do it that give you more flexibility than what ModX does. But then you're getting into frameworks like Ruby on Rails and micro frameworks like Sinatra. So that actually depends on like how much control you actually want over the site, right? Like WordPress provides you a pretty awesome construct. 
Talk to Drupal a little bit. Um, talking about the idea, of, you said a couple things. Uh, first, to answer your question, just as a as a, just a point, I'm building a site right now that's completely designer like. They, they arguably are not full on web designers, but pretty close. And they took we took this theme from it's responsive to, so you got three breakpoints. I built that site, and I haven't actually written a line of PHP on the theme template side. I haven't written a a theme template. There's no overrides. Um, there, you can get to the point now with Drupal at least that things like creating a two thirds third responsive collapsible Jim to burn. Granted, there's a lot of CSS, a little bit of JavaScript, a lot of CSS. But the point is, um, really, the amount of overriding and PHP knowledge or anything like that, a lot of that's been extrapolated away um, in the Drupal world. That's a theme. Going on, sorry. Going here, Mike. For Joomla, Joomla does have something called template overrides, which any element you want, you can just set a style or override specifically for that element, and then if somebody else has that, they can just take that template override and throw it on their site, and they'll have the exact same look and feel that they would for uh, for just that specific element. So you can't go down to an element element level like I want to skin this slideshow this way. I want to skin. Um, this calendar this way. And it's just a bunch of template overrides, and that's actually how a lot of the theme providers do that. They have their template, and then they let's say they want um, you know this you know all these different extensions to have for their teams. They just throw in their template overrides for all those. And they, you know, it's done. So in that case, is template overrides just kind of like a package of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript for one region on the of the page? It, pretty much, because you you know with the MVC structure you have your view, and it's just essentially an override of the view. And, and so yes, 
guys. It's it's it it'll have some, it's the PHP poker the view in there if there is that, and so you can customize what that view looks like. But yeah, it's just an override really of the view. Yeah, so the template override is a PHP file that produces output for the browser. So it'll produce whatever PH, whatever HTML, CSS, JavaScript you code into it. I would suggest that Modex ends up looking really interesting in response to your question because you're not dealing with you're not dealing with blocks, you're not dealing with PHP, you're writing HTML. It's just like you're sitting down and you're you know, coding it from scratch. It gives you as much flexibility without any of the redirection. And then you fill in blocks with the chunks of, of static content or dynamic content you want. That's not for everyone. I mean, a lot of people you know, want to be able to say, hey, I want to grab this module and it's going to put this calendar in this spot. It's going to connect my Google Calendar. And that's all I need to do. And WordPress and Drupal and Joomla are good at this. Joomla's got the, the bootstrap, which some people say you know, means that your site's going to look like a lot of other sites. But it's going to look good. You know, I think that Monex gives you a lot of flexibility there without the layers of complexity. Mm -hmm. The layers of complexity give you flexibility too. The nice thing about C5 is that I have little programming experience. I can look at PHP, I can understand it, I, can, I know CSS, I know HTML. I have looked at what was done in the C5 site, and I actually built something new power that. Just looking at what a page template is, how to actually change my templates, how to change what I need to, and actually um, blocks themselves can have different sort, different types of themes that you can actually uh, attribute to them. So all of my main, main navigation actually has a theme for that navigation, and that can change in CSS. If I like the way something looks on another site and it's built in C5, I can go to the marketplace and find that block and actually just import it. And as long as Everything's named the same way. You know, I can just drop it and it's right there. In this respect, the site core is way more of a framework than a CMS, I guess, because there's no concept of themes. There's no prepackaged look and feels that I can install. I'm building my components. I'm building my CSS and markup from the ground up. I can go and pull in Bootstrap and use Bootstrap components to make components in site core, but I'm not going to come in and just install a new theme and have a new look and feel. It's your markup. It's your site. It's your application. The questions are Oh, I was actually curious. One, how many of you on the panel have actually filled out in all of the major CMSs? <laughs> um, <laughs> that I had or themes, so you could actually give an answer on which one was the quickest and most efficient? So I haven't quickest. built a C5 theme, but I've played with C5 and I've built uh, on I haven't built a uh, mod action either, but I played with that. Um, and what I can say is Joomla and Drupal are the slowest, uh, the most difficult. Uh, Joomla, there's a lot of extra things you need to do. WordPress is really, really easy to make a theme. Uh, at a bare minimum, you can do it in two files. Um, or you get really, really bad. You have a ton of files, and everything is really easy. And then there's a ton of, like, uh, I guess starter frameworks for WordPress themes. So, for example, I built a few of them where it basically just gives you the file structure that's most optimal. You don't need that much, that much but it sets you at a good starting place and you can go from there. When you say speed and performance, do you mean like web server speed or do you mean building speed? Oh, uh, speed of the template. Oh, okay. well, yeah, or, yeah, WordPress is the way you want to build them. I, I, would, I would agree with Bran after you read the WordPress code. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just, just read the template hierarchy, then you're good to go. I actually just walked in front of mine through um, taking a static site and moving it to a WordPress team, and there's step-by-step -step guides up there to make it extremely easy. So it's like, hey, you have this file, replace this part of it with this. You know, where your title is, replace it this function. Um, it's, you don't even need to know PHP to start doing it. It helps. Them. Okay, we have, I have a little bit longer, so we'll have more, a couple more questions. Right, so in regard to the, the last question, which would be the easiest and most difficult to put it in order? You have to attempt to be easy. I was going to say, what context? The, the developer or the user? 
Yeah. Yeah. It's just for yeah. Addition. Yeah. 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 And creating a look down feel as well as its functionality. As a developer, give them a look and feel. As a designer, so designer, designer has, has said, I want to be like this. Well, I have a designer, but I have, I have um, played with all of them except Sightboard. And um, I have found both WordPress to be the easiest. Uh, C5 is the last one I looked at, and that's when it was first coming out. Uh, but then also found um, Drupal, then Drupal. So, uh, so should we like go to lunch? I'm ready to arrange our talks. What do you think? Just feeling the last one. Yeah, I'm ready. 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 Yeah, find out is there is no objective answer to that question. Yeah, we'll get to uh, A lot of it depends on how you think, honestly. Yeah. Different people think and work in different ways. And what's going to be easy for one person is going to be very difficult for another, even if it's the exact same task. Uh, I'll, speaking for myself, I found Drupal very, very hard to get along with. But that was a long time ago, and it's gotten better. And it wasn't. It's, it was. It's as much my fault as it is Drupal's because I wasn't. I didn't think the way the Drupal developers thought. And what I thought was a nice, rational way to do it was something that they didn't think was a rational way to do it. And that's not saying that either one of us was wrong. And I have a grudge with WordPress. It's my turn. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would put it in the opinionated software way. I mean, we, we actually have. A, there's a thing called the Drupal way. And that's not like tongue in cheek. There's like there's a methodology and thinking, and being in that community for a long time. And I'm not saying you need to be in it for years and years and years, but yes, Arlen's absolutely right. If you come from any of these sides and come to Drupal, you'd be confused at for a moment. If you work within the constraints, I want to be really clear what I just said. We are taking a full-on green sky design, implementing it in responsive without writing a line of template code. We'll be very clear. Multiple page layouts, not a sidebar with a body. I'm talking a third, two thirds, full, two thirds stacking. Doing doing things that are not trivial in any way. Um, so that that's my like. I would not say Drupal last year. I say Drupal now is the easiest to be for because I'm able to control the output from my front end developers very very granularly with not a lot of modules or hacking core. Um, just worked on a WordPress site that was actually a dream that whole thing. You get to edit CSS in the site, that's crazy. Um, <laughs> there's actually a module for Google to do that too, of course. But um, yeah, I mean, that, that, and I'm out of my depth now. Cause I think. Yeah, everybody gave great answers. I have to snap them up. You know, WordPress is obviously the easiest. I haven't looked at the new versions of Drupal, but I say WordPress, you know, Drupal, like Core, Drupal, and Drupal, and Drupal, and Drupal. I'm going to defer to a current and former Trevera employee who has experience with multiple CMSs, and I'll ask Michael and Jess what they think. I'm just a sales guy. I don't do any code. 
voting, so I'm going to let them. Well, I asked the objective <laughs> question, but um, I'm going to easily go with WordPress can create by Joomla, Drupal, and Drupal 8. I have not. No one has. It, so. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's, that's my order. Michael, what do you think? I, I found, honestly, it all be pretty equal because they all kind of break down to here's my HTML. Here's my call for the top, here's my call for the left, right, middle, bottom. And this once you get those in there, your, your content's there. I think it's just knowing what, yeah. what each one's there, set the call for. And like you said, there's very much a word for this way. Cool guys, yeah. yeah. like, yeah. like the coding standard that we all go up to is very, like, we all find switch, like, stage fit to that. And, uh, you know, like, the, all of the constructs that we put up and all the APIs that are in here, like, all the top, the top for, uh, like, uh, input set of stage fit and output validation, all of a sudden we do is, like, it's all very common practices for the way we're supposed to be doing So once you know the work this way of doing it, it sort of becomes, like, this second nature of like, programming like that one. Yeah, you can you can call functions you've never used before because you know yeah. instinctively know it's going to be kind of like apples and stuff. Okay. Kind of thing I've also um things you can see in Linux, which I cannot do, mm -hmm. but if you can get uh, HTML CSS, you're holding the internal and you can cut it out to roughly eight minutes. You can just take eight months. I've I've worked with four or six of those for many many years, <laughs> and. I am a graphic designer by trade, but I've been doing development for 15 years also. Uh, if I was to gauge that, dot x is my entry instantaneously. If I can slice up a, a design with HTML and CSS, all I do is copy and paste my code into the system. That's all I need. And I have to put one tag. What is the content that I've revealed that I'm done. That's my x. I would say I've been working with Drupal 7, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to 8. Um, I've been working with Zen and tons of responsive sites the last year. Um, I still don't like pushing boxes. Away. And that's how I feel with Joomla, WordPress, and Drupal. You're always starting with a framework, a theme. And as a designer, I feel like I'm constrained. So once I get in there, I have to push boxes around. Instead of, I'm going to make the CSS in the HTML the way I want it. I'm going to test it to make sure everything works. And then I push it into the system. And it takes it in my apps. Everybody else is pushing boxes. That's why I think we're just. With the create your own yeah. boxes. I create my own boxes. And that's what you do with my apps. I create my own boxes. In WordPress settings. Right. And you have to learn the, the syntax for the system. There, there's the, the trade off with all the, the major systems that use a template inside. They all have their own their bed. That's just my Question here? Um, yeah. So we've been looking at the problem from the perspective of the developer. Um, Mr. Sitecore, Cy uh, I'm sorry, I don't know. Um, says the right tool for the right job. And I believe that to be true. As you're consulting with the client, as they are explaining explain to you their aspirations, their resources, their you know, what they're looking to do, what, uh, as you are considering different steps, what are the, deci the decision tree? What are those flags that, well, this is a better application for this platform, for this platform? So from the from the perspective of the client need, how do you make those decisions? I think you really have to look at the need and look at how well your system does it. I've definitely looked at projects and said, you know, this isn't a good fit. Uh, well, what are those markers? What are those markers? Um, <coughs> language? There's, there's, why do you say language? Yeah, yeah. 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 or I don't say for those. Yeah, I mean, I, I constantly give you for there's a there's a referral network right here that's already like in, in working because and here are the things that I I totally look for. I said it in my presentation. You have a lot. Of then WordPress kind of just that's too general. Uh, then you start getting to the WordPress Joomla Concrete Five world. Then it becomes um, support. We start to look at feature list. What what is the model space working? All of a sudden, mod X falls by the side because they don't have X level of whatever integration that's of course, for the project. Um, and then you really get to the resource because then you start to look at the amount of resources you have because then we can start to say, based on these couple things, there's one or two or three things. Um, say core. Oh, uh, my company runs on all .NET and we have developers. Well, then all of a sudden the the cost for licensing Sitecore becomes about a quarter of a .NET dev per year. So, 
So all of a sudden, those licensing dollars become very trivial. The integration and IDE, all the cool stuff that you get was moving to that. So there's there's all these decision points on functionality, cost, and uh, just um, existing. What are you walking into? Is it green fields that have existing projects that have existing Drupal? All the kind of legacy technical debt type of issues. Um, yeah, I mean, most of the time you'll. Um, like a small business, right? They just want a brochure website. Any of the content management systems will work. So it's you know whatever the developers want to go with. No, oh no 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 no. That that sounds really wrong to me because <laughs> <laughs> no, I, there's, I, there's a lot of. So when I well, say the, I mean, yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> no, 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 I don't mean that either. What I mean is, um, I. It comes down to trust a lot. I've, I've realized in my projects that I've, I've been having lately. Um, I have a person that came to me and says, uh, we used X card to make our e-commerce site, but we want to do this, this, and this, and we can't do it. I say, well, great, we're going to do this and this. He goes, so that's written out X card and replacement for by six. Unfortunately, yes, he was right. Because I feel like the, the decision path that I was led on by my previous developer was the wrong one. They knew I wanted to do these things, but they had the X cart hammer, and they started hammering on it. And it really didn't serve their business needs at all, at all. And so I think choosing someone when you're making these decisions that is halfway agnostic, that knows the landscape, that's like your biggest first hurdle, is finding someone to trust who buys you on these things. So I can't tell you about projects recently that you come into, and there's literally this is a massive bad advice problem. To start off. And then they come to you too with all these this fun that the previous company or developer had done. So they've been just mistrained and misadvised, and I find that to be the biggest issue. Sorry, I jumped on it. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So it's the idea that they're just like, oh, did you hear? <coughs> it's typically employed by companies that make large proprietary systems. Uh, oh, no, so no, no, no. <laughs> Okay, we're well, at uh, 9 o'clock, so we're uh, ready to wrap up here. You guys can uh, hang around for a couple more minutes if you'd like. And